good Wednesday evening to you, everybody. How the heck are you? I, of course, am your happy to be here, humble host, Bill Sylvie, the Dungeon Delver. And we got a great Wednesday ahead of us, guys. Uh, Kyle will be in the studio. I was as surprised as you were. I know. I know. Calm down. I was as surprised as you guys are. Kyle will be here tonight. Now, he might shit talk me, but I'm going to cut him off at the pass because I asked him, because I looked on my calendar. We're very professional around here. I looked on my calendar, greetings, Robert Phillips, and it said, Wasteful Wednesday. Now, Kyle created that and put it up there. So I assumed that everything was hunky dory. Now he had canceled it because, you know, he's he's got the kids home for school holidays, and we are very pro family around here, so we completely understand that. But he said, Hey, I want uh, you know, I want to let you know I, I, I'm not I'm not gonna be there. So I asked him. Because I saw the appointment on the calendar, I said, are you going to be here? And he said, it's not on the calendar, is it? Like he's going to bust my chops for not paying attention. But I'm like, it's there. I see it. But as luck would have it, the kids are off doing an activity. So he's going to be in the house this, this afternoon. He's got to warm up the garage. His man cave, his garage He's got to warm up because it's like, you know, five years ago or six centuries in the future or uh, planet Hoth or something. I don't know how time zones work. It's a different time and it's a different time of the year. It is the dead of winter down in Australia. So he's got to get that garage warmed up and I'm sure he's getting himself a bracing cup of Australian coffee, which I think. I think it's just kangaroo blood. I, I don't know. I did, Do you know? I don't know. But anyway, so when he gets here, we're going to talk about now. I, I made a big whoop, a big to do that we're going to talk about Todd Rundgren. It's Brian Eno. Brian, apparently he has had, Kyle has had this brainstorm. And we're going to talk about Brian Eno and D&D &D tonight. So I'm looking forward to that. So we're gonna we're gonna be doing that, and in the interim, we'll just shoot the breeze. Tomorrow night, now tomorrow night, this is the international direction you indicate when you're talking about a, a, a later day. Tomorrow, not yesterday. Tomorrow, uh, we're gonna be talking about. We're going to be digging more and ask for. We've just kind of started to scrape the surface of the published copy of Lost Caverns of Sojkop. So we're going to look at that. Hello, Damien. I see you over there. So we're going to look at S4. And then on Friday, we're going to look at S4 again. But Friday night, we're going to play some Gamma World. And that's going to be a lot of fun. So, lots of fun stuff coming up on the show later in this week. Kyle will be with us shortly, and we're not going to talk about S4 tonight. Hence the kind of vague and non-descriptive uh, language in the description there. Because it occurred to me, I hadn't put up a link to the show. You guys were just wandering around out there in the wilderness going, where, where, where's the show? Where... Where's Bill? What are we going to do tonight at 7.30? And to you, I say, relax. Everything's fine. Everything's okay. Relax. It's okay. I got you covered. But it, it was a little late that I got it posted up about a half an hour ago. So whether you're coming in from Twitter, whether you're coming in from just the YouTube algorithm sends you here. Whether you came in from Discord 
And guess what? We do have a Discord you can join. I'll link you in the chat if you're interested. Um, welcome. And welcome. We have new viewers. I, I, I haven't looked at the the uh, subs count on uh, YouTube in a few days, but it's... It's jumped up there some. So... I, I was really happy about that. So welcome. Welcome. Come on in. Sit down. We'll talk about role-playing game stuff. Um, what else is going on? Oh, uh, I, I was, I was going to mention this. Now, I realize we've all been given, uh, you finished reading The Dragon Masters by Jack Vance. It's pure Gamma World Nitro Fuel. Love it. Love me some Jack Vance. Um, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, this thing went down with Jameson Stone and uh, Satin, 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 Satin. Anyway. Uh, so this thing went down uh, with Jameson Stone and Satin Phil uh, Phoenix. Phoenix. I'm not going to dwell on it. I'm not going to talk about it. Other than to say, for a thing that was shaking the foundations of the hot, and even I was like, ooh. For a thing that was shaking the foundation of the hobby, man, a lot of people seem to have forgotten about it. Not a peep. Not a peep. More about it. I think they're kind of laying low. I think they're kind of keeping their heads down, which is probably wise. And that's all the updates you're going to get out of that for me, unless something else blows up. Damien says, came, out, came here from Fallout 4, been running around the Commonwealth with a flak gun. Oh, yes. Uh, I haven't played Fallout 4 in a while. There, I was doing it for a long time. Um, I installed a few mods. I installed a few mods. Uh, I installed a swimming pool mod. So I can put swimming pools in my settlements. That's a lot of fun. Another mod that I installed lets you put way taller buildings and settlements. And why is that important? Why is that important? I'll tell you why that's important. Um, it's important because it kills your frame rate. <laughs> but it also, like, there, there's this, this uh, alley in downtown Boston that you could technically put a settlement of maybe five or six people in a ramshackle shed in and have like a workbench, couple of patches for food. I install this mod that lets you build vertically way more than they give you just in the vanilla game. And the reason I did that was, and I'll tell you why I did that. The reason I installed that mod, um, there's this farm near the, uh, the, the Red Rocket gas station where you can also build a settlement. Um, and it was at Red Rocket that I said, well, wait a minute. I can't build enough settlements around here and have shops and food and everything like that. So I just started building vertically. I just, I just built a, a medium-rise apartment building. Um, so when I went over to this farm, I real well, I, I, I figured out pretty quick how to build high-rise condominiums. And I go over to this farm and I'm like, how tall can I make this thing? And the sector of map it's in has this insane height level for building stuff. I mean, it's crazy how big, how tall I can make things. I built 
a 17 story, which I, I realize in real world terms, that's not that big. In Fallout, that's, I mean, because the tallest building in the Commonwealth that's still standing and that's pre-war is uh, the, the Commonwealth Fusion Building. That thing's nuts high. And you can build way taller than that if you install this mod. But I installed the mod after building a condominium. So all of my settlements have the maximum number of people and these fully tricked out multiple fusion generators. They got arcades. They got restaurants. They got hospitals. They got shops everything mass fusion that's it thank you Damien. everything i've got they're just gargantuan the only downside is the only downside is is i like them to be like modern skyscrapers and have glass walls there's only three traders you can buy glass from and it's actually pretty scarce on the ground. Um, just gathering it up. So, yeah, if you, if you want to make glass walls, it can be kind of difficult. But I've had a whole lot of fun building up, rebuilding the Commonwealth with these, these self-sufficient. I should point out these are self-sufficient condominiums. Nobody complains about food. Nobody complains about beds. Everybody's happy. I've been slowly but surely building those all over the Commonwealth. And you better bet that, 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 that they're uh, well defended. Thank you, Praxis. I'm rather fond of it myself. Nobody makes good D&D wearable merch right now. Everybody's just looks slightly off. I'm not crazy about it. Or else I would get more stuff like this. Like a few years ago, like I got my Dungeon Master's Guide shirt, which you guys have seen me wear. That's literally just a pre-distressed copy of the art. It, it, it's like they, they scanned it, put some old beat up marks in it, and it looks like the front of the Dungeon Master's Guide. There's this that looks like the cover of the Red Box. Um, I have seen Monster Manual shirts. There is a Player's Handbook shirt out, but it looks pretty wonkadelic. I think it's, it's a copy. It's obviously a copy. And I'm not in love with it. But anyway, this is my picture of sartorial perfection. And speaking of people who are sartorially perfect, let me go ahead and bring in our co-host Kyle because I see him lingering in the green room. And if I leave him out there too long, he'll gorge himself on Vegemite and we can't have that. So without further ado, let's say hello. Kyle, how the heck are you, my friend? Hey, boys and girls. girls. You started early. I started a little early. I just wanted to run my mouth for a while. So you I know got, how it uh, I got Dungeon Minister's merch that arrived finally. Yes. That that is a that is a fine looking uh coffee mug there. I, I of course have the pint glass version. You have the coffee mug. This is my my gym um coffee mug. I'm trying to uh, if anyone new comes along and they happen to know about Dungeons and Dragons, then uh, or or similar, then you know it might they they might notice, yeah, because you always keep your eye open for dice and things like that, don't you? If you know if you go to somebody's house, or something, and you see dice, the polyhedrals, <laughs> or you see a little figurine, or like, oh ah, yes, one of us, one of us, <laughs> they speak my alignment language. <laughs> I, I was, uh, there was some YouTuber I was watching. Um, and I, I mentioned this before about YouTubers who do kind of nerdy pursuits will put crap like this up on their shelves 
in their studio mm-hmm. area. Like I'll grab one of these games or books and read it or reference it or, or use it in regular play or whatever. But there, there's a lot of YouTubers that because D and D has experienced resurgence, whether you want to call it shrewd marketing on Wizards part or Stranger Things or whatever. It's just for them, it's marketing 101. You know, you, you see a guy who wants to rant about, you know, owning the liberals in Hollywood or whatever, and he's got, <laughs> you know, an oversized, he's got an oversized D20 sitting on his, <laughs> on his shelf behind him. Yeah, that guy's just looking for a game group. Yeah. yeah. That's all it is. But, but I, I like one one guy I, I like asked and said, Oh, I I see the the dice you got there. Do you do you play? And you know, is his response, nah, mate. <laughs> I didn't pursue it, but I'm like, the fuck you got it out there for? It? Oh, right. Because you know, uh you're getting views by the nerd uh classic nerd fallacy of he's one of us. <laughs> Well, see, you used to get attention just by putting pictures of hot chicks everywhere, chicks in bikinis and stuff. But now, so now he's, you're saying you get attention by having the the nerd merch up there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I've got a little bit of cheesecake, but you can hardly see it. I got Vampirella up here, but it's so distorted by the studio lights and everything, you can't tell. But. Um, yeah, so uh, so you're here. We we've had this thing, you and I. We've had this thing on our punch list of topics, and it's it, it's to do with Brian Eno. And I got to admit, you've explained it to me, and I'm still not sure about Brian. But it always like we get distracted and start talking about stuff, and it gets pushed down and pushed down and pushed down, and then we're like. <laughs> Okay, next time we're going to talk about Brian Eno, and it's turning into the uh, what is it? The Jimmy Kimmel Ben folds five joke. He, he just, <laughs> like he'll do his whole show, and at the end of the night, say, you know, uh, our apologies to Ben fold five. We ran out of time. <laughs> Hopefully, we can have you on again. And like they've been on the show a couple of times, but like they're never on when he does that joke. They're never scheduled to be on. So, Mark Ripito of Starting Strength Fame has got. Um has got his own little podcast and whatever. And uh, sometime during almost every podcast, he says, we keep telling Joe Rogan we're not coming on. <laughs> I should just start doing that. Just, just, you know, just, uh, well, you know, uh, Mike Merles keeps begging me to be on the show. I'm not going to do it. I, I'm sorry, Mike. This is an old school show. You can't be on. No, I'd rather be on Rogan. I'd like to hear Rogan's <laughs> thoughts on D&D. I'm a little scared, like Rogan, like these controversial streamers like Rogan or Jordan Peterson, like, I just don't want to sit there and be browbeaten for like 90 minutes, you know, like, cause Rogan, Rogan, either talking about D and D or, or God forbid showing up to play D and D he'd, he, he'd be like, <laughs> he'd be a total munchkin. Oh yeah. I need guy. you to understand my fighter has 18 by a hundred strength. Bill, do you get that? And I'm like, uh, I don't, you didn't, I didn't see you roll it. You know, so now Ro- Rogan would play Cinnabar <laughs> to accommodate his y- unique special. Yes. Ro- Rogan would play Cinnabar. Uh, Jordan Peterson. Uh, no, I see Jordan Peterson rolling in with a copy of Avalon Hills diplomacy. You know? I, I thought him as more with darkness, the inner struggle. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, every, I, every world of darkness game has got that inner struggle, right? The, uh, like the, the vampire's got the humanity, you know, you, you're gradually drifting off to become a pure blood sucking fiend rather than just a partial blood sucking fiend. I, I remember what the one in Werewolf was. And then in a mage, there's paradox where you just create too much magic around and people notice. So demons come and eat you to restore normality in the world. When, when I first saw Matrix, I thought, my God, it's mage. That's what mage wealth does. <laughs> Cause that's what I, happens. You know, you could do your little magic thing, but if it's coincidental, someone slips on a banana peel or whatever, that that's all right. You get away with it. But if you do anything too obnoxious, then agent Smith shows up and, <laughs> just delete thought, you. It's me. It's <laughs> they ripped it off. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, I so was uh, in a struggle. Yeah. 
Yeah. J j okay. Jordan Peterson, World of Darkness. Now, I don't just for our, for our audience, all four of them out there watching and future watchers. We don't do politics on this show. We we don't. Uh, Kyle is what I would call for, from an American point of view, a classical liberal. I am a classical conservative. That's it. That is the breadth and depth of the political discussion. I only mention this because of the D and D content back in 2015. That's how long ago it was 2015 when this BS about our orcs racist started to blow up. And that first paper put out by some person about how they were came up one of the people. And I was floored. I was completely caught flat footed by this. A few segments of surprise, if you will, Michelle Malkin, goes on Facebook and does this th this video rant about it. And it starts off and she's holding open. I not, not just like holding in front of her face. She's holding a, a, a one E dungeon master's guide and just brings it down and says, Oh, hi, I was just preparing for tonight's game with my husband and my kids. And then starts to talk about the lunacy of this. And I did a little <laughs> bit of digging and I found out that Ms. Malkin is an old school D and D player. So mm -hmm. I thought I thought that was interesting. That's the only reason I bring it up. Um, find them everywhere. You they even ask some um, what D&D &D setting are they using in Stranger Things? They're not using any uh, particular setting. It's obviously a homebrew. Uh, yeah. And the, the times that you see them playing D&D, &D, um, yeah, it's very much, uh, much obviously a homebrew. Uh, so when the, when the younger kids are playing Will and that, uh, they just talk about, you know, oh, yes, and then you're doing the cobbles, and then the Demogorgon appears, you know, so they're just doing a generic dungeon. Uh, yeah. There's no mention of setting. Uh, and then in the last season, when you've got the older guy, uh, Eddie, Eddie Munzer, the, the, the freak of the, of the Hellfire Club, uh, he talks about the cult of Vecna. They fight the cult of Vecna and all these hooded guys mm -hmm. and, and so on. Uh, so it's obviously, uh, yeah, but I mean, they're using first edition. Yeah. But because yeah. uh, that's that was what was around then. They're not using basic. Basic, you do uh, see a screenshot of basic uh, in in one of the seasons. They're, they're handing a, a box of uh, game stuff to another kid. And mm -hmm. at the top of it all, it's a red box. Yeah. A red box set. Uh, but aside from that, in play, you see them using um, a first edition, but they're not, you don't see them following the rules and so on that, you know, uh, you know, are you going to fight? And, okay, roll your damage, you know, so they, they don't do a D20 roll to hit and everything. They're, they're not bothering about the rules and that. They just show the kids throwing their dice and so that they can have some dramatic moments of like, you know, throwing the dice across the table and, and then it goes slow-mo and the players go, oh, will it make it? You know, he needs a 20 to, yeah. to do it yeah. himself. But yeah, there's no set uh, distinct setting mentioned at all. Yeah, I mean, D&D &D is very much a prop, which uh, that's not to say I think the Duffer brothers are, are faking it, but at the same time, I mean, you know, how much time and granted the episodes are fairly long, but how much time as a studio exec, if they came to you and said, okay, first we're going to have each of them roll three die six and write those numbers down. <laughs> and then they're going to go in and they're going to declare their actions. Then they're going to roll a D six for initiative. I mean, I can just see the guy from Netflix going, <laughs> yeah, could we just like maybe we just kind of condense that and have the exciting parts? I mean, I think the Duffer brothers are smarter than that, but that's how it would go if you said, no, no, we have to show actual, you know, real by the numbers D and D play. Um, so yeah, I, but I mean, you know, that's that's not what the series is about. I mean, the the D and D yeah. is there for it's to bind this little group of friends together. Yes. Um, and on one hand, that could equally be baseball or something. But on the other hand, what you've got is a little group of kids who are a little bit nerdy, so they don't quite fit in with the other kids, uh, which makes it more likely for them to be effectively an adventuring party. Yeah. Because you know, the essence of the adventuring party is the autonomy. They go around doing things themselves. So 
there's lots of moments in the series as in any action movie or any thriller tv series or whatever it's like why don't they just go to the fbi <laughs> you know? but if they did that that would be the end of the adventure you know if you call yeah. on the if you call on the authorities so uh they want to have a little autonomous team that goes around having adventures and so part of it, one of the ways they do that is to have them be nerdy and D and D helps them do that as well i think there's a thematic thing of here's the kids who are living in a fantasy world and some of the fantasy world ends up being true all the equivalent there really are demons there really is a negative material plane um so it provides a nice contrast and it shapes their their view of the world and so they're like well you know i it's like the old joke. I, I didn't learn. I didn't play all that D and D without learning something about standing up for your principles. <laughs> yeah, it's that yeah. kind of thing. Uh, so well, that's, I mean, it's, it's not the place. It's like when you, when you, yeah, when you watch uh, the Sandlot, which is another great movie about kids bonding together. Um, they're not like screaming about you know the ball was outside the foul line. You know, uh, did, did he, uh, you know, was he safe or was he out? You know, he was leaning over the plate or, you know, the, the kid pitching the ball balked. That's not what the, that's not what the movie, the Sandlot's about. The movie, the Sandlot is about kids being kids and going through their life and, and having life experiences. So, yeah. uh, it was, uh, I asked because I realized on my drive home from the gym outside of D and D online, the bulk of the Watsi era D and D video games take place in forgotten realms and not the TSR originals. Well, forgotten realms was a TSR original forgotten realms. I mean, I might, I might bag on it. I might, I might gig Ed Greenwood periodically, but forgotten realms is very much, uh, rooted in first edition AD and D it started as a one E AD and D setting. Um, and I know a lot of people who like for them, the gray box is it. They don't, the, the literal metric ton of other stuff that came out for forgotten realms. They're just like, look, if you just ignore that and just use the forgotten realms box set, you got a setting that's just as cool as Greyhawk. I don't know that I agree with that, but I feel where they're coming from. Um, with that said, uh, yeah, Watsy. I imagine it's got to be very painful for Watsy to watch Stranger Things because I have had more people talk to me after AD&D games that I played in public venues after seeing uh, after the first season of Stranger Things dropped. And that was a while ago, too. Uh, people have said to me, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I saw people playing D and D and Stranger Things, and and I saw you were playing classic D and D, and that's the D and D I wanted to play. This was just like it was when I was a kid. This was just like it was in Str and I mean, Watsy can't sell. They won't sell classic D and D anymore, so they can't really finish making that connection. They tried with the Stranger Things basic D and D set, but by all <laughs> accounts, that that's like. That's effectively a board game. <laughs> it, it, it comes in a box that looks like the red box D and D set, the the fragments are basic D and D set, but you can't, you don't roll your own characters. It's not, it's, it's literally just a, a board style adventure game. Well, yeah, but that, I mean, that's the nature of large corporations because they focus, they spend so much time defending their intellectual property, their branding and so on in court and, and other places. They think it's all about the branding rather than about the substance mm -hmm. and the substance does matter there, there's even um i don't think it's much of a spoiler to say in one episode of stranger things one of the kids the other kids are giving him a hard time because he likes new coke some of you guys <laughs> might not might be too young to remember that yeah. back in the 80s there was a period where coke decided hey we've got this great product that everyone loves and it's the most popular drink in the world let's make it even better <laughs> let's mess with that <laughs> And so they made new coke and everyone hated it so then they tried they tried to save face a bit by having new coke and classic coke and then eventually they dropped new coke because nobody liked it yeah <laughs> it was just the occasional crazy guy like 
Um, so I won't spoil it and say which was the crazy guy who liked the new Coke. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, so they, they think it's all about branding and uh, you know, and obviously branding does matter, but there's got to be some substance to it too for the thing to have legs, to have uh, longevity. Um, but thinking on Stranger Things brings us back to the, the Brian Eno. Because <clears throat> I was joking with Bill about, like, you could have a bingo game of all the things that they, all the other media that they've ripped off from. Obviously, there's D and D that they ripped off from, um, but yeah, they've ripped off from so many other movies, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and <laughs> um, yeah. and all the um, Friday the Thirteenth movies, and so on. They've ripped off from so much stuff. It's just you, you could have a whole bingo game just of that, um, and uh, but. I mean, I don't think that's a bad thing. This is what I've always been telling you guys you do, you should do when you're making your campaigns. You just rip off. You, you roll some stuff up and then uh, you uh, rip some stuff off and then you know, from other media and then you tack it together with your random dice rolls. Uh, so the Brian Eno thing about creativity was I saw this Netflix show about creativity. And Brian Eno said that uh, creating music wasn't was like gardening. He said, you, you know, you don't lay it out. It's not like architecture where you plan it out all exactly from ground up. He said it's more like gardening where, you know, you, you do a basic layout and then the plants are going to grow where they're going to grow. Uh, you may actually want it over here, but it doesn't work over here. It needs more sunlight or whatever and it grows over there and some plants will spontaneously appear. So, uh, and, and I think the analogy f holds fairly well for uh, creating a campaign because in gardening, you can have like landscape gardening and you can empl employ a full-time gardener who goes around trims all the hedges and you can get anything to grow anywhere if you, you know, will put enough energy and fer artificial fertilizer and, and pesticides and everything into it. But if you want it to grow with uh, the minimum effort and drama, you need to kind of go with the way the land is. You know, that certain things will grow in sandy soil, certain things will grow in clay soil and so on. Uh, and you look at the things that spontaneously pop up and appear. And, and a certain structure will appear without your trying. Um, I was trying to think of it this morning, but I've forgotten the title. Somebody had this drone picture of a forest. And there's mm -hmm. a, I've forgotten the name for it, but there's a sort of a, a, a thing of the trees don't overlap each other. They end up looking like the head of a broccoli or something. There's always this line between the trees and it's an irregular line. And that, that's obviously because if they do overlap each other, those leaves then can't get sunlight. So those leaves don't survive and they drop off. So the trees end up kind of fitting in together somehow in this really irregular kind of pattern. Um, and I think it's a, it's, you, so even without the, the trees trying to have a structure, they actually create a structure during their growth. And I think the same sort of thing happens with a campaign where if you put in a few initial elements and then the players add their own elements with their own comments and, and actions that they do, and you have your elements that you add with your random dice rolls, a structure does appear without you trying to create it over time. So, and that was, so that was Brian, you know, the musician talking about that. Um, it was a Netflix show about creativity, I think, uh, called uh, "The Mind Explained" or something. They they talk they have a different theme. There's you know one on memory, one on language, one on creativity, one on orgasms. There's all sorts in there. So yeah, so that's Brian Eno. Well, and I think that that's that's absolutely true. I mean, the world of Greyhawk campaign that I have going now consists of sessions i run with kyle sessions i run for you guys live on tuesday nights uh my monday night group is probably the force majeure if i'm using that term right um in shaping the world but i mean if the monday night group drifted off suddenly we had a schedule conflict and couldn't do it anymore or they just wanted to go play star frontiers or something instead uh another group would would kind of be shaping the world more than they are but all of those events and and dms keep your ears open keep your ears open when your players say something that sounds really cool like 
yeah, what if, uh, you know, what if the reason this, this river never freezes over despite it being up here in the Arctic is because it's like, you know, uh, the, the tears of a snow queen who can never come into, into warmer climes. If that, if that's cool to you, write that down, hmm. you know, it, it, it feeds your creative, your, your creative mind and it rewards the players for coming up with cool stuff. Yeah. Well, Praxis says homage is not a ripoff. And yeah, it is. It, homage is a ripoff. Homage is just a name to excuse a ripoff, Praxis. But the thing <laughs> is, it's it's hard not to do a ripoff because, you know, there's only so many grains of sand in the world. There's, there's only so many ideas out there. Um, there's only so many ways to do the same thing. Uh yeah, there's a lot of wrong ways, but there's only so many right ways. I've seen this recently. My son's got really into Rubik's cubing, and uh, um, there are algorithms they use. So when they see a certain pattern in the randomness, they respond by doing a, a certain series of turns that brings a little bit more order to the apparent chaos of that cube. So there's there's this enormous number of possible combinations, but there's only a few that kind of that make any sense and that you are going to see when you scramble a cube. Uh, it's a bit like uh, uh, like chess. So there's this little um, little experiment got done where they got a bunch of chess grandmasters and chess novices and they had look at a, the layout of a game, like halfway through a game, and then turn around in their chairs and reproduce that layout on the board behind them. And as you expect, grandmasters are better at doing that than novices. But if instead of reproducing the middle of a game, you just have a random layout of the pieces across the board, grandmasters are no better than novices at, at reproducing that. Because grandmasters don't have a better memory, they have a better understanding of the language of chess and the way a game flows. So, the, the thing about uh, the ripoffs is that it, it's not randomly put in, right? They didn't, in Stranger Things, they didn't have a bit of Cylons from Battlestar Galactica. You know, it's not random. It, it has to be something fantasy. It can't be something sci-fi. Um, so it's it's not completely random what they're tossing in. They, they're, they're putting in particular elements to create this language. It's the language of the fantasy world. So yeah, there's only so many ways to do it. So you can't avoid ripoffs, and it's not an homage. It's a it's a ripoff. Um, they're deliberately putting in these elements because they make sense to people. It makes sense. It's the, it, there's the language of chess. There's a language of fantasy literature. You know, there's the guy with the sword that, who fights. There's the, the the wizard who sends people across the room or sets things on fire and so on. Uh, there, there's the person who heals. There's the person who sneaks through. There's the the repartee between the characters and so on, uh, the the banter. Um, there, there's the skeptical. There, there's the villagers raging pitchforks and so on. Um, there, there's the evil monsters that present themselves as just misunderstood and you know they're essentially sociopaths. They like the monsters are like ah, I'm just doing what everyone else secretly wants to do. Um, <laughs> so these things appear again and again in the fantasy world in fantasy settings and they they appear that because they resonate with people so yes it is ripoffs it's not an homage if of course it's bloody ripoffs but that's all right it it's it's not a jigsaw that only fits together in one particular way you take these different elements and you, and you mix them up and then you add one or two other things you add the dice rolls and you add the players actions and you come up with something that's a little bit different and again, it's like gardening, you know. The, the, so the, yeah, there's a zillion and one ways to do it wrong. There's only a few ways to do it right. Yeah, I mean that that's um, that that's an absolute truth. I mean, I am unabashed in cribbing ideas from things. We wouldn't have any form of D and D if Gary or Dave had been shy about lifting <laughs> ideas from places. I mean, it is said that Dave started his fantasy D&D &D campaign 
when they were playing chain mail, just historical chain mail, and somebody at the table, it was like Celts versus Romans, or no, I'm sorry, not, not Dave, uh, Gary, Celts versus Romans, and somebody said, hey, my Celts have got a druid with them, and he's going to cast a lightning bolt. Because <laughs> they they had they had watched um, an episode of Star Trek where uh, uh, the god Apollo is an alien living on a planet, and he zaps somebody with a lightning bolt. <laughs> and so we got D and D. We get we. I mean, literally, the first inspiration of Dungeons and Dragons was to steal an idea from Star Trek. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I will tell you, uh, and if you argue against this statement, just understand going forward, you're wrong, um, <laughs> that the best rock and roll band in the, in the world, the greatest rock and roll band of all time, is Led Zeppelin. I've heard nothing before then, uh, before they came along to contradict that, and nothing since uh, their inception to contradict that. Led Zeppelin is really good. Their best songs, uh, or a, a great many of their best songs, are just Mississippi Delta blues with electric guitar. Um, when the levee breaks, go find the original When the Levee Breaks. I don't mean the original like the first time Zeppelin recorded it. I mean 1921 Robert Johnson recording of it or lead belly or whoever it was uh gallows pole yeah led zeppelin didn't write gallows pole um and it, it just goes on and on and on and yes absolutely they they lifted all that stuff there's a very funny story that bb king tells about meeting uh i i think it was uh eric clapton and ginger baker met bb king and we're so enamored of him because King had, had done, had done, uh, you know, such great blues, formative blues work in the fifties and sixties. They said, Hey, can we come and watch you perform? We're going to be in the United States. We're going to be touring. Can we come and watch you perform? He's like, yeah, sure. Love to see you. Love to see you. So they find out he's, he's going to be performing like this, this little roadhouse. And so, there's Eric Clapton and Ginger Baker and a bunch of other famous Brit rockers from the 60s and early 70s. They basically, they pull up their tour bus and they just fill up this place. And the way B.B. King tells the story is, he said his drummer looks out, the house lights come up, they get ready to do their thing, they come out, and his drummer looks over, his drummer's smoking a joint, and there's all these white people sitting out in the audience and he flips out it's like he flips out he drops the joint and he and he's like yelling at the band members that's the police the cops are here <laughs> and baby says, no 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 it's okay it's all right <laughs> <laughs> well i discovered the other day i think i shared it in the discord um in sub-saharan africa Apparently, in, in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, American country music is really popular. Country and Western is really popular. That's awesome. Because a lot of them in the rural areas, because they relate to it, because it's, it's rural guys with a cattle farm who are socially conservative, <laughs> and a lot of them, yeah, English speakers, and... These guys like to wear jeans and they like to wear cowboy, like snakeskin boots, and they like to wear, um, you know, the Stetson hats and all the rest. Um, so, yeah, and they, they're these guys doing boot scooting and dancing at, at festivals and stuff. How would they like it? And they're making their own versions of that. And, like, that, and like they're guys who make their living touring around sub Saharan Africa doing the country music. <laughs> that's and awesome apparently even back in this back in the 70s there was a guy who who did his own versions in um in 
um, well, it is Swahili, of course, but in uh, KwaZulu language and so on, like anti-apartheid songs as country and Western songs. <laughs> <laughs> so 9,000 miles from home for whatever reason, you know, your company sent you to build a, 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 a satellite phone repeater station or something like that. You're out in the middle of nowhere. It's 105 degrees in the shade. And you hear the faint strains of Johnny Cash wafting out across exactly. the sky. Yeah, it was like Johnny Cash. <laughs> That's awesome. This black dude standing on stage, um, you know, this Kenyan dude standing on stage going, you know, I walk the line. <laughs> Because they imitate the tone and everything, it's great. Oh man, I've got, I've got to, I've got to find that. Well, you know, you know, there's a just next door. I don't know anything about African geography. I apologize. I don't know where it would be, but Botswana for the last decade or so has had a huge metal scene, <laughs> like, like Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Dio, Metallica. It's huge in Botswana, and they got a bunch of local bands there that are big too. Um, yeah. So, so who wants yeah. to go to Kenya and tell them that, you know, ripping off is wrong? <laughs> Just go to that so. bar in Nairobi where there's achy, breaky heart playing in Swahili. Yeah. <laughs> and tell them that's wrong. Ah, whatever. <laughs> they yeah. rip off. Well, I mean, even even to, 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 bring, to bring it down a little bit more local, of course, we've all heard LaGrange by, uh, by um, ZZ Top. You know, it's a great, great little gritty Texas rock song. But, uh, uh, you know, um, I, can't, I can't, I don't know the ZZ Top members off the top of my head, but, um, you know, they come in there that, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. Oh. Well, that's, that's John Lee Hooker's jam, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. And, well, they finally got to meet John Lee Hooker. Like after LaGrange got big, they were at a, a music festival and there's John Lee Hooker. And they're like, oh my God, we never like, they didn't write a letter to him and say, hey, can we have permission to, to do your, your <laughs> bark, bark laughing? And, they're, and so it's like, well, okay, crap. Let's, <laughs> let's go over there. We'll be in there. And they go over and that. And they're like, hey, we're huge fans. And he said, oh, yeah, you, you boys are all right. And, and they said, uh, we're so sorry we, t we, uh, we um, took your sound from that song. And he laughed and he said, we steal from each other all the time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he said, that's all right. Um, uh, Damien asked, didn't ZZ Top get that brothel mentioned uh in that song in trouble. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. The shack outside LaGrange is, is in reference <laughs> to the, is in reference to the bunny ranch. I think, um, uh, it was originally in Texas. They may have, they may have. <laughs> well, see, the, and, but that, see, that's the thing about, um, about the garden of creativity. You don't go into a lab and do some, genetic sequencing and mixing up and come up with your own plants and stick them in the garden. You take plants that already exist and plant them or seeds that you know that exist. You, you, know, you don't create your own plants. You just take old plants and you stick them together in a new way. Exactly. And organic is, it, in, in the case of creativity, I mean, let me tell you something. I cannot draw a straight line with a ruler. Okay. I have tried, I took every art class that was available from sixth grade when I was about 11 until I graduated high school, not because they were easy A's. They weren't. When you, when you start getting into the theory and understanding why certain drawings were, I mean, you have to study, you know, here I am thinking, yeah, I'll sit there for 45 minutes every uh, Friday afternoon and, you know, try and draw science fiction pictures. And, you know, your teacher hands you a textbook this thick on art history. But here's the thing. I took them all. I paid as much attention as I could. I had a stack of portfolios like this by the time I was done with uh, high school. Brothers and sisters, I can't, I can't draw. I can't do it. I tried so hard. And what I learned from that is you cannot force creativity. 
you you can't you can't force creativity you can't sit down and say i'm gonna be creative one two three create yeah it it, it doesn't work what you what you come up with isn't isn't good i mean od and d grew all right yes it was a labor but gary just found bits and ideas popped in his head and yes dave arneson gave him some impetus for things but things just happened and they grew in the garden okay they grew in the garden and when it was good he encouraged its growth and when it was bad he pruned it and put that aside but he didn't force it and we have years of good product I mean, that's the beauty of, of AD and D is you never finish playing AD and D. Mm -hmm. It's not like, well, I played all of the AD and D. I guess I have to start playing second edition now. No, I mean, you just keep playing it, playing it, playing it, playing it. Um, and that's why corporate D and D, I mean, you, you look at the list of designers and there are pages of people who've had their fingers in the creation of fifth edition and God bless them. I'm sure a bunch of them have very good intentions and so on and et cetera, but they are following a corporate formula or trying to create a corporate formula of product. Perfect D and D it's cart before horse. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it doesn't work, but I, that, I think, as I said before, I think that's kind of inherent in any any organization reaches a certain size and it stops being creative and productive, really, uh, because it, it just gets so caught up in its own little internal processes and it's concerned about its image outside and protecting what it's already done that it no longer creates anything new the only way they can come up with something new is if they buy a smaller company which is you know what google and facebook and all the rest have, have done they know because they can no longer come up with anything new yeah um it, it's at most they refine what they've already got and, and tweak and, and twiddle with that a little bit but they don't if they try to come up with something new it just goes <laughs> fails dismally um so I think, like, even though wizards, we're not talking about something the size of uh, Google, but it, it's the same principle. It just reaches a certain size, and then everyone gets worried about job security and internal company politics and all the rest, and not knowing anything about the internal structure of wizards. But it's just human nature. It's not particular to nerds or whatever. It's just, it's the same in the, um, the same in the military and uh, and government organisations and large corporations shell whatever you know bp rebranded itself a while ago as beyond petroleum and, and now they um pump up more petroleum than they did before <laughs> so it's you know, it's just these things happen these things happen. it's yeah. just human nature so um i think for real creativity you want just um a, a few people one or a few people together <laughs> Brian Eno, it's got a duet with John Denver tonight. Did I miss it? Yeah, you missed it. You missed it, dude. Sorry. Yeah, that's that's what uh, that's what happens when you just kind of jump through the video and you know just like timestamp to timestamp. Um, <laughs> Brian Eno's music for John Denver, John Denver International Airport. I don't. That was a lot funnier <laughs> in my head than it came out to be. I'm sorry. Uh, I tell you what, if you, so here's an organic thing for you. Speaking of the Denver airport, um, there are so many conspiracy theories. Kyle, have you ever heard the conspiracy theories about the Denver international airport here in the, in no, America? No, I have not. There are people who are convinced at the very least, it is a SAC NORAD uh, fallback base, uh, which by the way, that's not a conspiracy theory. If major Air Force bases all bought a ground burst nuke, if you have an airport that can handle 747s, 
B-52s, B-1s, and B-2s will be landing there in the event of an emergency. Not that you're going to be appreciating it. Ooh, cool, warbirds. You're going to be, like, you know, digging a trench furiously under your house. But, um, <laughs> no, people believe the Denver International Airport is an Illuminati secret base, uh, <laughs> a Freemason-designed uh, place, which goes hand-in-glove with the Illuminati, uh, that it has an underground rail system designed to rapidly move people to to hidden locations, that there's like a secret Federal Reserve, that there's satanic implications, that if you look at like the outer marker radio beacons, that they form like the points of a star and therefore it would be a pentagram and just, <laughs> just tons of... Of lunacy. So one of the fun things you can do, see, here's some of that organic creativity happening right now. Um, the, the guys at GW were not, when they uh, came up with Twilight 2000, were not limited to just, you know, keep your tank running, buy, as, buy or steal as much food as you can to stay alive until you can get back to America, or if you're already in America, Till you can fight off some local warlord, etc. They came out with a supplement called Twilight Nightmares, where they were like, "Okay, Twilight 2000, but what if Cthulhu? <laughs> Twilight 2000, but what if aliens, and and so on, and etc." There's there's a little bit of fun you could have with it. Um, send your next, do some googling. Here's a little homework. For our viewers, do some Googling about the Denver International Airport conspiracy theories. Throw that into a Delta Green game. You're welcome. Or even a Twilight 2000 game. You're welcome. Well, another addition to a Delta uh, um, Green game, or Twilight 2000, if you're crazy enough, is um, is the Sov Citizen movement. So uh, a lot oh, of you will know about the, the, the sovereign citizens, the, the ones who, like, the, the state doesn't exist. It's actually a foreign corporation registered somewhere. And I am only sovereign. Citizens can be sovereign. Therefore, this police officer can't arrest me for speeding. And, and all this. And they, it occasionally pops up in Australia, too. It's mostly a US thing. It occasionally pops up in Australia. And um, it, it's the old, it, it comes down to telling the judge that you don't recognize the jurisdiction, um, which didn't work very well for the Nazi war criminals. No. <laughs> Just, <laughs> um, you know, what are they, what's their really realistic expectation? The judge is going to go, actually, you're right. Please go free. <laughs> yeah. We have no, <laughs> so, um, but the, in Russia, there are soft citizens as well. Um, but the Soviet citizens, they hold <laughs> that. <laughs> They hold that the Soviet Union still exists. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the growing movement of Soviet citizens, <laughs> they sell themselves. Um, so this is for Radio Free Liberty. Um, uh, Konstantin Vyatkin has never acknowledged the Soviet collapse. For the past 28 years, I've tried to live in this country called Russia, he says. But in my heart, I still live there in the Soviet Union. Um, apparently, two thirds of the population still professes nostalgia for the former empire. Uh, this was written before the recent war, so <laughs> they might feel a little bit differently now. I don't know, but anyway, um, yeah. So, at banks, police stations, and inside courtrooms across the country, people calling themselves citizens of the USSR demand their right to impunity before the legal system of the Russian Federation, a state they neither recognize nor apparently fear. <laughs> this guy in his this guy in his suit and his car and he carries around his passport <laughs> so he can show it to um he can show it to cops the organs of soviet power are being recreated on a website that claims to represent mvd sssr the soviet interior ministry for reference those were the guys who ran the soviet labor camps i'm not sure i would be giving my information to a website of, of guys who profess to be the organization that ran the Soviet labor camps. But that's just me. 
Yeah. He filled out an online form and paid 3,800 rubles, $58, to receive his Soviet passport. The organization, which is uses the Soviet SU domain, dot SU domain, but lists no address or other identifying details other than Moscow, um, told uh, Radio Free Europe in an email that it has issued more than 10,000 such passports since early 2018. Easy money, man. Easy money. On YouTube, Vyatkin found hundreds of channels peddling conspiracy theories that Russia is an offshore company registered in Delaware. <laughs> the President Vladimir Putin was was <laughs> the President Vladimir Putin was killed in 2012 and replaced by a body double. <laughs> that the Soviet Union and its ministries are being resurrected. Some gave him convincing explanations of the inequality he was witnessing in Russia. Because inequality in a society can only possibly be explained by... Okay. Um... <laughs> <laughs> but beyond feeling widespread Soviet nostalgia and disillusionment, the channels also promote ways newly minted Soviet citizens can skirt Russian laws, open bank accounts and evade taxes. Bloggers harass parliamentary deputies on camera, prank call government ministries, set up bank accounts using Soviet passports, and ridicule traffic cops who stop them for displaying illicit Soviet registration plates. Um, uh, there was it. Okay. Um, okay. Alexander Ulyanov, a 53-year-old blogger and Yuroslav, uh, puts this into practice for his YouTube blog. In one video, he drives around town with Soviet number plates and a dashboard camera. And when he's pulled over, he claims the officer has no authority over a citizen of the USSR since the Russian police represent a state that should not legally exist. Here we go again. I've heard all... Here, sorry, I've got to do my bad Russian accent. Here we go again. I've heard all this before, the officer says in the video. What year were you born? Ulyanov asks. 1985. What was the country? The USSR. Did someone deprive you of your USSR citizenship? What are you trying to tell me? That you're not a Russian citizen, but a citizen of the USSR, Ulyanov responds. From a legal standpoint, you have no right to address me. Ulyanov then presents his passport, driver's license, and insurance papers, all issued by ministries uh, claiming to represent the USSR. You understand what's happening? All the organs of Soviet power are being recreated. The baffled officer apparently lets him continue on his way. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the cop just like, right, whatever. I've got your address to send the ticket to. So off you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I find it, I, I find it funny that Sov sits in Russia exactly. versus Sov sits. In, it's like Sov sits in the West. View everything <laughs> is governmental tyranny trying to take away their freedoms and sob sits in Russia are like, we want governmental tyranny to, tyranny to take away all these freedoms. Yes. We've registered with the ministry of the interior so that they know where to, they know who we are to send us to labor camps. <laughs> Couldn't you come and brutalize us just a little bit, please? And the funny thing is I, I, I was trying, I was looking it up and I, I thought it was a uh, transnistria, but I I'm uh transnistria but I, I'm not right about that. Don't, don't, don't go harass those people. But there is a, there's a tight, there's a thin little Soviet or ex Soviet Republic in uh, the former Soviet Union. And it's part of the Russian Federation that they quite literally are Soviet style communists still in their, their it, it, like, it's the only country that still has the hammer and sickle in its flag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's this tiny little slender sliver of nation, and I can't remember where it's at. It may it's, actually it's in between Moldova and uh, Ukraine. So that was one of the worries when Russia initially invaded Ukraine that if they overran it, they'd go all the way and take over Moldova because Moldova is basically um, yeah, it's an ethnic minority, and um, it used to be part of the Soviet Union and then became independent in the nineties, like all the others. Um, but Transnistria was a little part that still wanted to be associated with Russia, because all the all the former Soviet countries have got Russian ethnic minorities in, um, and it wasn't necessarily a deliberate attempt by the the Russians to uh, to displace the locals. It was just you know to to build things to 
to, you know, to build bridges and have hospitals and stuff, they needed to send out en engineers and doctors and workers, and they sent them out. And so as a result, those countries have all got some hundreds of thousands or millions or whatever of uh, people of ethnic Russian heritage. So the, the, basically the, the Russians in Moldova wanted to still be part associated with Russia. So they had a little rebellion and war in the early 90s, and then Russian peacekeeper troops came in and, and sat in there. So there's a couple of thousand Russian troops sitting in uh, Transnistria, but uh, they're just peacekeeping troops. They're just guys with assault rifles. It's not like they're going to turn around and head east and, and do a massive flanking maneuver on Ukraine. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so that's Transnistria, little Soviets. They've still got the hammer and sickle on, on uh, Yeah, like so, so I mean, why, why aren't these, why aren't these Soviet citizens that they could go right there. It could be just like 1985 all over again. If they, would just, <laughs> if they would just go there, it's horrible. It's oppressive. It's communist with a capital C. Well, it's a bit hard to get there at the moment. <laughs> to pass through a war zone. Yeah, well. <laughs> through um, and also, I think they want communism without the miserable grinding poverty. I know that communism inevitably leads to miserable grinding poverty, but... <laughs> Russia at the moment doesn't have it for everyone. At least some people are well off. Because notice that that guy who had his Soviet passport, um, he was sitting in a business suit in a, like a, a BMW or something. It was yeah. nice. I don't know cars, but nice indoor interior uh, furnishings on that thing. He wasn't. It wasn't some guy who was like standing knee deep in the mud, in a paddock somewhere in in the middle of Siberia. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's like I, I love to point out, you see like these horrible lefty rants about what an awful, awful thing capitalism is and how terrible America is and so on and et cetera. And then at the bottom of them, like if it's on a forum or in an email or a tweet, you'll see posted from my iPhone. <laughs> and then, you know, to 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 flip that around, you know, when, when you've got, uh, uh, a, a hamburger American guilty as charged, uh, you know, complaining about the government taking every penny and this, that, and the other, you know, when you keel over in your front yard from, you know, your third blocked artery that year, the ambulance that shows you up and shows up and takes you to the hospital is driving on a paved road so you know. <laughs> well we do fairly well here in the west you know um this was somebody was talking about uh, uh fitness um and uh, that basically people don't have enough motivation to look after their own health because uh, in the modern west you can literally just lie down in the street and do nothing and someone will eventually come along and take you away and look after you and keep you alive. Even if you continue to insist on doing nothing and just lying there, <laughs> if they take you out of hospital and then you, you walk out of hospital and you lie down <laughs> in front of the, uh, the doors in the hospital and you just lie there, eventually <laughs> someone will pick you up again and take you back inside. <laughs> and you will be fed and watered. You will be looked after. You can do absolutely nothing and someone will take care of you. You will not have a terribly good quality of life, but they'll keep you alive. Yeah. This is this is rather historically unique. Uh, we're in a wonderful position where, uh, you know, the worst thing, uh, with, you know, the biggest struggle in our life is arguing between first and fifth edition D&D. &D. Yeah, I, I mean, there's... C 130 landing at your house, Kyle. Yeah, that's the the chopper going overhead. That's okay. The They're probably off to shoot some protesters. <laughs> um. No, the uh, the 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 sovereign citizen thing. It just it just cracks me up. I, you know, that's something. I, I am amazed, and maybe it's in paranoia. I, I've never uh, looked too closely at paranoia past the first edition, but that is something you'd have to fit into into a comedy role playing game, a role playing game that was geared towards. Uh, well, most most Cthulhu games turn into comedy role playing games. They That's, do. I mean, 
that's always been the problem for me with running a Cthulhu game because you, you just make all this effort to build dramatic tension and then somebody cracks a joke. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, we, we've, my friend Jeff and I have had this discussion before, and it's basically that your intention is to have Stephen King, Peter Straub, H.P. Lovecraft, so on and et cetera, to fuse this game of horror. And the whole thing collapses when you drive the lime green van with the daisy decals on the side and the mystery machine logo right through that wall. And no matter what you, the keeper, want, your players are playing Scooby-Doo. <laughs> or scream. <laughs> or scream. Yeah, if you want it a little bit bloodier, they're, uh, the, the, they're playing scream. But it has been my uh, experience that the longer a Call of Cthulhu game goes on, and let's let's real talk about Call of Cthulhu for a second here. How many of you game masters out there have had long running Call of Cthulhu campaigns? I've been going in this AD and D campaign on Monday nights. I've been running it for these folks, lovely people, just beautiful people, uh, since 2017, 2014, no, 2014. I've been running it since 2014. Um, I don't think, and Kyle, you can slap the lie out of my mouth if I'm speaking untrue, but I don't, I don't think a Call of Cthulhu campaign could have that legs like that. Well, no, because everyone goes insane or dies before then. Yeah, the, the sanity is the the uh, the sanity is limiting uh, game mechanic um, because uh, people forget uh, you don't just. So those who don't know, you have a, a sanity stat somewhere between 1 and 100. Um, it's one percentile stat. And each time you see something horrific, you basically make a saving throw, try to roll above your current sanity. Um, and if you fail, then you lose some multiple, one, 1d4, 1d6, 2d10, whatever, of sanity. Uh, people tend to forget you don't only lose sanity from uh, seeing... Cthulhu with his tentacles or whatever, but you also lose your sanity if you see a friend um, have his head chopped off or something. You know, you, you could see quite mundane horrors that that appear in the real world and lose sanity. And of course, it, it's a bl an ablative thing. And as I said, you you fail your saving throw if you roll above your current sanity. So uh, the crazier you get, the easier it is to get crazier. <laughs> it's it's just it's. Uh, it's a it's a plunge thing. It's a, you know you're accelerating. You you're dropping from a very great height, and you go faster and faster. Now you you can recover sanity by like if you kill the monster, you recover some sanity. Like okay, I the, the monster horribly tore apart my friend, but pfft, I've killed the monster. I've re restored order to the world, um, and you can also recover from sanity uh, some sanity by seeing a psychiatrist or, or being um, committed yep. for a little time. But the the amount you can recover is never really quite as much as the amount that you would lose on average. Yeah. So it's, it's random roll, so you could get lucky, or, but you could get unlucky. But the average is um, you don't recover. So, you know, you're always mentally scarred by what you've experienced, um, <clears throat> which is a, a pretty kind of dark view of the universe, but that's Cthulhu. Um, yeah. Yeah, you, you're always scarred. It stays with you, man. I remember, I remember that day. And so, yeah, so by its nature, it, it, it can't last for years and years. You can, you basically, you do a campaign. There's, you know, the, the uh, Nialatep uh, campaign and so on. And if you make it to the end of the campaign, you know, basically your character is retired then. <laughs> They've had that experience. But it's, we, we kind of have to remember what a campaign is. You know, the, the, the term campaign comes back from that comes from war games in the end, and campaign being a series of battles to accomplish a particular to capture this city or whatever. So, a lot of soldiers historically would just be involved in one campaign, and after that they would be uh, they'd be wounded or they'd be sick or they'd be demobilized or they'd be sent home and back to garrison duties and so on. You know, there are not many guys in World War One who were 
in the army in August 1914 and did the Battle of the Somme and did Battle of Cambrai and did the, the assault on the Hindenburg Line and so on. You know, there's not many guys, we're not many guys in World War II who um, fought in Africa and in Sicily and landed at Normandy and landed in the south of France and did the, the Battle of the Bulge and so on. There's not many guys did all those. Those are all individual campaigns. So, you know, we use, with role-playing games, we use the, the term more generally to mean any sort of continuous set of play with more or less the same group of players. Or we, we also broaden the term to mean that game master's world, the campaign world. And so it becomes the same thing, campaign and the world becomes the same thing. But if you think of it in terms of war game, then it makes a little bit more sense. A bunch of characters, a bunch of individuals probably will only be involved in one substantial campaign. And then the rest of the time is, you know, they trained and then they're in the campaign and then they were on garrison duty or they were recovering from it. Or, yes, you've done your duty. Thanks. Go home. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, the, yeah, like the guys who went and fought in Vietnam or, or uh, Afghanistan or whatever. Most of them did one or two tours and then came home. They didn't, you know, they didn't stay there from the, the first day of U.S. involvement in 1958 or whatever, right through to the fall of Saigon in, in 1975. Mm. They didn't stay through the whole time. <laughs> that would be a bit much to ask of anyone. So, um, so uh, it's the same with Cthulhu games. And I think, you know, it, it probably should be the same with most D&D &D games. It, you know, it, unless you're being really soft on the players, um, they're going to lose characters. It's going to be very rare to have like your four to six players, say five players, start with first level characters and then play for 10 years and they've got the same five characters 10 years later, but they're now, you know, 15th level or something. That's going to be very rare. You're going to have a turnover of players. You're going to have a turnover of characters. Characters die, retire and so on. <coughs> well, I will say that I've kept the same players but there's just, there's one character, one character that has made it from, uh, and I, I mentioned this before, this campaign that's going on was the alternate campaign we were going to play for a couple of weeks <laughs> and then get back to the other because we were short a few players. And it has now carried on into the future. We played for a year or two, and now we have this, the 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 alternate campaign is the one that's been going for years and years and years and years um but uh of that group one player uh kyle you know her aurora she has um she has had the same character other players had characters have died but they have been high enough level that they've said, okay, well, let's try and get them resurrected. And then to a one, they've made their, their, uh, system shock rolls. So I will say that we, there is one exception, but yeah, everybody in this campaign is pretty beaten up on the constitution side otherwise. And I am <laughs> not playing favorites. I, I, I have not played. She just has not been hit with, a death ray or a fireball that does like 30, uh, you know, her total hit point <laughs> plus 30 more points or anything like that. It just hasn't happened to her yet. She is that, um, she, she, she is like that, uh, that, that non-com, you know, she just, just everybody looks to her character. <laughs> like, what do we do? Well, um, <laughs> everybody with a pole arm in the second rank, everybody with a great sword in the first rank, spell casters all the way in the back, you know. <laughs> um, Tucker asks, Where is everyone? Uh, you know, we have some nights that are up and down. Um, we've been lucky, and there's nights when we get 20, 20 I think, I, I think our peak has been like 22 people in here at times, and uh, their nights are a little quieter. And sometimes they're quieter, but somebody or other goes back and watches and we see that there's a, a couple hundred views later on. People go and catch up. 
the metrics are steady. Let me just say that. And I thank everybody who watches, everybody who subscribes, whether you come here and you only watch the, the Let's Play videos, because we do two of those a week, Tuesday night AD&D and Friday night first edition Gamma World, or whether you, um, you know, whether, whether you uh, just stop by to hear the BSing. I've had some people say that, that, Kyle and I just sitting here talking about whatever is like the best, the be the best content that I make. I've had other people say, I want you to look at ultra obscure, tiny little kitchen sink press RPGs only, you know, I'm not going to do that only, but, but our <laughs> metrics are steady. So, so thank you. Uh, good evening, Vincent. It's good to see you. And then there's times like I I've seen this before. Um, uh, Mike says he watches the replay later in the night. See, we we have that. Uh, I try not to focus too much on the number that's next to the eye there, right above me in mm -hmm. uh, in Streamyard. I I like to focus on what Kyle and I are talking about and what feedback you guys are giving me. That's yeah. The most there's um there's a, a younger uh, barbell coach that I've been uh, talking to a lot recently. Younger in the sense of how long he's been coaching people and how many people he's coached and so on. Um, and yeah, and that's been my advice to him just, just to get out there and coach people and do the job, you know, because he's previously been given advice about putting out all this content on social media or carefully crafted and watching his metrics and blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, you know, yeah, you just get out there on the gym floor and talk to people and, and teach them to lift, uh, and, then the ones that you do have lifting regularly with you, you talk about on social media. This is Jim. He's 45, in his 40s. He was overweight, had a bad back, and now he got stronger and he feels much better and he manages all his training with three kids. Isn't Look at Jim. Jim is awesome. And you just talk about how awesome people are and you just keep getting out there and coaching people. And then over time, you get more and more attention and, uh, and people come in, uh, as in my case, People who I don't know uh, refer people to my gym to, to come and train. And it's exactly the same being a game master. You just get out there, run your games. People will come in. Friends will bring their, their friends in to game with you. And eventually people who you don't know will tell people to come and game with you. And I, I believe it's the same with creating a little show like this. You know, we, we just go ahead, just keep pumping out the content, talking about what we love and... Uh, Eventually, people will watch. Yeah. Will it be zillions? No. Do I make, do I make a mint from, from this gym? No. But, you know, it's, I make a living and, and uh, I have some fun times and all the rest and meet some great people and change a few lives. And this is the same with gaming or producing gaming content or whatever. You know, you, we make a zillion. No. But, you know, you'll have some fun and, um, and improve some people's lives because like, they have fun too. Exactly. And, socialized, and I see I see some wacky stuff sometimes. Like I've seen this a couple of times when Kyle and I have been on and it's happened uh like we do we do these uh nerd council of doom things. Uh it's kind of a round robin uh on different people's channels sometimes. <clears throat> it's like we'll be flat on watchers for you know an hour, hour and a half, and then in the last 10 minutes, I don't know, the YouTube algorithm just goes, oh, fine, you've been talking for a while, fine, I'll just, <laughs> and I'll, like, you know, I'll look over and it's like, yeah, well, you know, I had a great time and I hope you did too, and I glance down and, like, it's going 10, 11, 14, 16, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> about to, you guys are literally coming in at the end credits uh, so you know uh, well, I'll go back and watch it you know so so it 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 is what it is and again you know I I, I know I'm never going to get rich doing this right and nobody's ever going to back a dump truck of money up to my house and say more more videos from your garage well you that's that's because you keep refusing to go on Joe Rogan, though he keeps inviting you. <laughs> I'm not. Look, <laughs> Joe, I'm not coming on your show, bud. I'm not doing it. I'm not. I, I'm not going on the. Kyle. Oh crap! 
you're not mentioning that because you've given in and you're going to do Rogan, are you? Are you no, doing? No, 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 no. I already, I already told Wendy Williams that I wouldn't go, and that's why she had to close her show. <sighs> you're, you're a heartbreaking man, Kyle. You know they, 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 they talk that's about. That's why her show is closed, and she's like off YouTube and everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I, I just, I can't get stretched that thin. Okay. So I'm sorry, Joe, from the bottom of my heart. I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm only. We're still I'm considering one... that offer from the view though. <laughs> I'm going to let you fly solo on the view. Cause honestly, <laughs> I, I've said some. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know if there's an Australian version of the view that doesn't have the horrible, horrible harpies that the American version does. And if that's the case, more power to you. But uh, um, well, we, we did have one for a while. I don't know if it's still going, but we, yeah, we had an Australian version of the view for a while. It was exactly uh, the same. <laughs> uh, it's just, it. the, these shows are all the same. We've got, we've got one here called the project and the just little panel of people talking, um, it, it's just the views that the, the right wing guys like to talk on their own and the left wing guys like to talk in a little panel. But I mean, that's that's their politics, isn't it? You know, the individual versus, you know, the collective. Let's work together. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a diff different thing. Uh, Tucker wants to know how I say no to Joe. Well, look, if you saw the previous shows where we talked about why we're saying no to Joe Rogan, then, you know, I'm not going to go over it again. I'm sorry. I just, we've wasted a lot of electrons already talking about it. But those of you who know, you understand. So I, I'm, I'm just, it's, it's a joke. It's a wind up. We've never. The closest the I get. Go ahead. What, yeah, we were talking earlier about Jordan Peterson walking into the, into the uh, game store with his copy of World of Darkness to. <laughs> ready to run again <laughs> i you get you gotta admit peterson with that vocal fry on his voice would be a pretty good horror game uh game master you know and he's been in a russian rehab facility so he'd have good insight on on horror <laughs> yikes wow i did not know i i know very little about jordan peterson other than he winds up people like people are mad about him so um, yeah, yeah. Well, a, a couple of years ago, um, he had some uh, benzodiazepine or something addiction or whatever, and he checked himself into mm -hmm. a Russian facility because those guys don't mess around. They like they just lock you up. <laughs> you <laughs> okay. mean they just lock you up and let you go cold turkey, and then however long it takes you to go cold turkey, they wait again the same period or whatever. It, there's no warm fuzzies. There's no walks in the garden in the nice green garden while you talk about your feelings or whatever <laughs> they just they chuck you in this padded cell and let you you know see the spiders crawling out of your eyeballs and stuff ah! <laughs> so, uh <-huh. laughs> so uh, he went there <sighs> he went there um yeah there was a bit of schadenfreude from everyone because you know, the guy who talks so much about personal responsibility and resolve it's turns out to be a drug addict but that's that's not surprising you know we the, the big moral preachers are all <laughs> whatever yeah. they're preaching about that's their thing so <laughs> yeah I, I'm, I'm trying to think there was uh, a great story by uh, ambrose beers uh talking about um oh I can't, I, I can't remember what it was but a guy basically uh he met the devil uh in the woods and um cut a deal with him for personal wealth or a longer life. And, but when he got home, like this formerly miserly cold man, like realized what he'd done and like, he'd be praying the loudest and the hardest in church. People look over and he's just like shaking with a religious fervor, you know, because he had done the naughty. <laughs> he'd made a deal I like this. Uh, Jordan Peterson sounds like Kermit about to cry. <laughs> I saw a comment the other day saying like Kermit and Grover and so on and El Kermit Grover and Elmo used to be regular American names before those Muppets came along and now nobody uses them. <laughs> you know, hey, you even me... had a president Grover. <laughs> Fellow Gen Xers, let me ask you something. Fellow Gen Xers who grew up watching Bugs Bunny cartoons. 
How many of you out there think the 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 name Nimrod is a nincompoop or an idiot or a failure because Bugs Bunny would refer to Elmer Fudd periodically as Nimrod? <laughs> like Nimrod is this badass uh, hunter from uh, from Greek myth. Yeah, it's because Bugs Bunny kept uh, calling Elmer Fudd Nimrod periodically. And it's an Israeli name that pops up fairly often. Need the clickbait titles for your videos. Famous YouTuber decline, declines Joe Rogan interview. <laughs> <laughs> Should I do that? Should I like, do that in tomorrow night's video uh, description? Just, uh, you know... Blah blah blah, whatever. Talking about S four, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then in parens at the end. Once again, I am not going on the Joe Rogan show. <laughs> I have Lorraine Williams as a guest. Absolutely, if she wanted to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, I would absolutely have Lorraine Williams on the show as a guest. Um, I would have very harsh and very probing questions for her. I would not be. I would not be like screaming, losing my shit. Uh, uh, Bill Hicks on a rant level hostile with her. I wouldn't be nicey nicey with her. I would say, Look, there's some questions everybody who loves DD has for you. Um, because nobody, I'll let you in on a little secret. Kyle's already aware of this, not you, Kyle, but everybody out there in the audience. Nobody at TSR in the 70s and 80s was a saint none of them none of them i've said it before and i'll say it again when people say what was gary like i try and preface that my response with when i knew gary when i knew gary he was nerd santa claus he was an <laughs> awesome guy very patient when i would send him drafts and ask him questions, even when I got screwed out of Teeth of the Bark Ash Noir by Frank Mentzer, and I went to Gary and I said, let me fix it, because I believed, instead of going through the manuscript myself, I believed what was fed back to me. He didn't say, you fucked this up, Sylvie. I don't want you doing anything else. It's over. Goodbye. Gary said, nope. I need you to focus on this legendary adventure stuff. You have two legendary adventures books to write for me. That's what Gary said to me. And that was awesome. And I felt at least a little bit better about it that he hadn't just kicked me to the curb because he liked the stuff I'd written so far so much that the teeth of the Barkish North thing didn't put him off of working with me. Now he passed away a little bit after that. Nothing I wrote for him except for lost crypt section of teeth got published um with all that said i've heard stories that in the 70s and 80s gary was a real piece of crap to everyone around him well i think i, I think it's sort of anyone who comes up with anything relatively new has to be a bit obnoxious because if you if you're disrupting the status quo in any way Mm -hmm. um, and e even that's just starting a fish and chip shop and your little strip of ships, uh, shops, you know, little, the burger joint or whatever. Disrupting the status quo in any way, you have to be a bit obnoxious and, and willing to butt heads with people. And if your company is, if, if your company is either shrinking or growing, companies don't stay static, they're either shrinking or growing. If it's shrinking, then you get more obnoxious because you you know you're trying to stop it from sinking and you know you're worried and all the rest and if it's growing you start to get arrogant and cocky about it and so you become obnoxious about that <laughs> so i think it's the na nature number one of creating something new and number two of uh, creating a business you know i mean it's like me when i started in the globo gym training people or whatever and uh and part of what pushed me to come to this place was there was a woman doing cleans that's the, the rapid exercise where you rapidly take the bar off from the floor up to your shoulder and she was dropping them afterwards and she was using those rubber plates that are designed to be dropped uh 
and all the rest. And a gym member came up and abused her and made her cry. And the gym management backed him. And I almost walked out on the spot. And But I have to be really honest, I had had for a year or two just some frustrations with the place and the, and the way it was being run compared to the way I wanted to do things and some thoughts of doing my own thing in my garage or, or elsewhere. <clears throat> and I had this little fantasy of having a dramatic argument with the manager and like, screw you guys, I'm going home. You know, pulling the, <laughs> doing the Cartman. <laughs> I had that fantasy. And so that I, I had been looking for an excuse like that, looking for some moment like that. In other words, I was waiting for an excuse to be obnoxious. I could have just quietly gone and said, look, this place doesn't really suit me anymore. You know, I, I feel it'd be better for myself and the people I train to, to move on. Could have just quietly gone, made that decision on any particular day. But I was looking for a fight, damn it. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to fight and I wanted to be, so, because I, I wanted to accomplish something. So I think it's inevitable in anyone who tries to accomplish something vaguely new, come up with a new training system, uh, a new kind of game, um, uh, a new operating system for computers, anything like that. Mm -hmm. I think you have to be a bit obnoxious for uh, in your nature for that to happen. Sure. And, and likewise, a business. If you're going to build a business, you have to be willing to annoy people not so much that obnoxiousness is required in order for success i don't think it is but i think it's it's required for you to want to do it because if you're the type who just want you know you're super agreeable and you want to just get along with others you probably don't rock the boat you, you mm -hmm. probably don't disrupt things too much so i think that's probably inevitable uh, but then 20 or 30 years later you can be the nerd santa claus yeah, no, I, I, there, there's, there's absolute truth to that. Uh, my uh, buddy of mine, you guys know him on chat, uh, Volcano God. He and I have talked about Steve Jobs a lot. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Pirates of Silicon Valley. Now, I won't watch a uh, Hail Michael. Um, I won't watch uh, the two different Steve Jobs movies that came out almost simultaneously a few years ago i won't s sit and watch that man being lionized um and we can talk about the garden of ideas and that sort of thing and how he collected ideas about user interfaces and system design and then got other people to do it for him because steve jobs was not a programmer and he was not a uh he, he was he was not a, a technician. He was not a pure technician. He was a manager of people. Um, Steve Jobs was fundamentally a horrible, awful person. He was cruel. He was unkind. He was unkind to his employees. He was unkind to his family. Uh, the people directly responsible for some of Apple's biggest successes, he abused on a daily basis to the point that um, one guy had a nervous breakdown and Jobs had to call the police on him because he went to Jobs' house near the Apple campus and was throwing rocks. It was, it was like heaping <laughs> rocks at Jobs' house, screaming at him. Um, that's the kind of person Steve Jobs was. Uh, I would not sit here and pretend to say that Apple under Steve Jobs was anything other than an amazing success because it was, it absolutely was. He stole the Xerox idea right about the same time that Apple and a company most of you have probably never heard of called Vizion stole the Xerox idea they got there right around the same time that um, that Microsoft did. I'm sorry, I said Apple. I meant uh, Apple stole it, Microsoft stole it, Vizion stole it, and Xerox was still trying to push their their star uh, text and graphics processing system, but theirs was like twenty thousand dollars in 1980, so it was prohibitively expensive. <laughs> um, but Jobs was the one to make a somewhat affordable GUI driven computer first. And he didn't do it by being nerd Santa Claus. That was Steve Wozniak's job. 
<laughs> Steve Wozniak was always a very jovial, approachable, decent fellow. Um, Steve Jobs was not. So, you know, people like Burrell Harris and so on, if you go to folklore.org, you can read all these horror stories about Steve Jobs, and I've repeated some of them here. Um, they, but, but yeah, back in the day, he was not a nice guy. Now, I will say, <laughs> up until he died, by all accounts, Steve Jobs was not a nice guy either. So I don't know that he ever had his nerd Santa Claus phase. He may have just left the being a decent human racket to, to Wozniak or, or someone else. Well, if he'd uh, lived long enough, he might have. Maybe. Like, Bill Gates seems to be trying to do that, not terribly successfully, but you know, he seems to be trying to no, do that Bill, at the moment. Bill Gates has transitioned from computer company guy to Bond villain, but we'll have that discussion. <laughs> I know, that's, but I mean, he's trying to. And the Bond yeah. villain is sometimes, in his own eyes, a Santa Claus. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very, you know, now that the tables are turned, it's very easy to forget that during the Microsoft trial in the 90s over Internet Explorer, that, like, prosecution, the FBI was, like, reading emails aloud in court from Bill Gates saying, hey, I think we should steal from these guys to destroy their company. What do you think? <laughs> and responses from, from uh, Steve Ballmer like, yes, that's a good idea. Let's steal from them and destroy their company. People, now that <coughs> Apple is in the catbird seat of the tech world, people are so willing to think of Microsoft as some scrappy underdog. <laughs> and Bill Gates is, uh, as some dark horse innovator. Guys, he, trust me, he was evil with a capital E. He just kind of did it in this gawky, nerdy fashion. And Steve Jobs was a, a, a absolute zero level cold technocrat asshole. So uh, that is correct, Michael. I agree with your statement there 100%. I'm not going to repeat it because, you know, YouTube, but um, I agree with you entirely. Uh, at least Steve Jobs was decent enough to die young, unlike Bill Gates. Ouch, a wig. Ouch. <laughs> and not that I don't. Well, disagree. that's what he gets for. That's what he gets for believing in naturopathy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Say, Steve, you know, you you've got like a like a stage one. We're fine. Just some small some markers in your liver. I'll eat all raw fruits and vegetables. That'll cure me. No, no, actually what will cure you will be uh, some rounds of chemo and maybe excision. No, no. I'll just eat strawberries and honey from now on. Oh God, you're going to die. <laughs> um, but anyway, anyway, so yes, the point is going all the way back. To the original question about would I have Lorraine Williams on the show? Sure. Sure. I am also completely under the the impression that like she will not, like flatly will not talk about TSR days. So what does so she do these days? Uh she is semi-retired and living in Europe now. Um by all accounts, her uh somebody quoted her CV at me and said that she had stated in her CV that she, uh, that she engineered a major financial turnaround at TSR. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like the Titanic turned around. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's like, um, captain Smith engineered a major, uh, vehicle redesign program on the Titanic. I made it from a surface ship into a submersible. <laughs> Uh, speaking uh, of disasters, uh, let's finish up. I saw a Netflix Interceptor. Matthew Riley, the action um, novel writer, he does, he's he got it's basically his vanity project. He's talked about right? it and he openly admits like he just he always wanted to direct an action movie. <laughs> and he's got all the cliches. There's the, the lone person in the middle of nowhere who has to, you know, do all the fighting themselves. It's got a chick in the lead. And she's jacked. It's great. It's not one of these like forty, you know, uh, not one of these um, one hundred and ten pound uh, chicks beating people up. It's a muscular chick beating up. Now she's still beating up guys bigger than her, but yeah, you know, it's an action movie. 
you know, like Rambo and uh, and uh, John Matrix and all those sorts of guys, you know, they they have ridiculous odds, but they succeed anyway. So the chicks can too. I, I don't see why not. Um, there's America has two anti-ballistic missile interceptor platforms. So somebody, uh, some terrorist engineer to shut them down at the same time as they're stealing a bunch of Russian mobile ICBMs and fire them on the United States. To what end is not really stated clearly in the movie. There's a bit of Russ Al Ghul kind of stuff and like America is corrupt and must be brought down so it could be rebuilt better. Um, <laughs> but a lot seem to be going for the motivation of money, their payment in US dollars to Swiss bank accounts. I'm not sure how much what US dollars would be worth if 16 US cities had been obliterated. Like yeah gold. i'd want gold myself but <laughs> uh but you know it's an action movie they don't you know that the terrorists don't usually have um a uh, political motivation in action movies like old die hard you know where he just <laughs> he, he lists the demands of releasing all these political prisons and, and ex-terrorists yes. from all these different groups and the authorities are going hey on who the hell is it like the communist one and the Muslim, the Palestinian terrorists, what? What's, yeah. We don't understand. <laughs> it's, just, great, it's just all bullshit to confuse them while he's getting the money. <laughs> that great Sato Voce conversation between uh, between um, Alexander Gudinov and, uh, and, and, and uh, Hans Gruber there, Asian Dawn, and he covers up the phone. I read about them in time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, it's nobody cares because it's just a chance to have some beat up. And most of it's filmed in just one in the command center. It's the uh, the anti-ballistic missile system, of course, is built on an oil rig in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Because, um, of course. So, yeah, because, of course, you would want to make it, you know, and it's like location classified. I, I think they can see it on Google Earth. You know, it's an oil platform. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So uh, yeah, it's, it's not 1942, guys. Um, so uh, yeah, anyway, and um, the uh, action star is this uh, woman. I've forgotten her name, but she's a, a Spanish model and actress who is actually Chris Hemsworth's wife. And Chris That's Hemsworth so appears too. And Chris Hemsworth that appears too. That is and the movie. The only reason anybody the watched. Yeah, the the movie's great. Um, and you know, she kills a guy by shoving a pistol in his eye. Like a pistol. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh, uh, oh, that's good. So it has, all that, it has all that, yeah, just like people die in needlessly elaborate ways. That's, but that's action movies. Awesome. So, and, um, yeah, it, it scores, uh, it scored about 40% on Rotten Tomatoes and four and a half out of 10 on IMDb, but I give it a 10 out of 10 for, uh, sorry, 10 out of 10. Give we, right. we have a we or, have uh, a 80s action movies basically because that's what it is it's an 80s action movie <laughs> we have some great character names too i love these character names because the bad guy played by luke bracy or brassy and i pronounce that uh alexander kessel <laughs> I mean, uh, that just that pops that that just that's got 80s action villain snap to it uh of course, we have the grizzled captain who's, you, you know, like, you're way out of line, Pataki, uh, you know, Captain John Welsh, you know, you got to love that. And Marcus Johnson, who honestly, Marcus Johnson would have worked for a character name. He just could have said Marcus Johnson as Marcus Johnson, but he plays General Dyson. Because come on, if you're making an 80s action movie, the guy standing in the dimly lit ops center at the Pentagon or in the White House, his name has to be General Dyson. You know, he's not, he's not like one of the fat fifty-year-old generals like Barry Corbin in uh, in, in uh, more games. No, 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 he's one of the like newly minted, maybe fought in the global war on terror, uh, young general is your General Dyson. Um, and then we have uh, General Crowthorn. Corporal Swain, uh, yeah, we, we have, oh, oh, uh, Ali Kadim as Dark Cloud, Japanese swordsman. 
Because, you know, just we I need some. Hey, what? I don't remember the Japanese swordsman. <coughs> there is a kung fu guy. <laughs> they send a kung fu guy into the uh, the bridge. It's basically, yeah, and when you look at it, it's like a Star Trek bridge. There's just like screens everywhere. And <laughs> Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, and then there's um, an, uh, a water tank with a tortoise in it in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> somebody's somebody's pet i don't know <laughs> so yeah it's uh it's a great movie 80s action movie and um you know if um you, you sit there with your beer and your pizza and your popcorn and and you watch this and you, you don't think too deeply on it because it's got lots of scenes that don't make sense you know they, oh, we, we've got this new video from the terrorist and it's just a guy in a balaclava in front of a mobile launcher waving his ak-47s and, sa and saying <laughs> and saying in a with these bad russian accent as bad as mine and they're going we are going to destroy 16 american cities and that's it he doesn't like say unless you give us a billion dollars <laughs> or um in the name of the asian dawn <laughs> <laughs> liberation front or something like that he just we're going to destroy like why did he have to tell them they've seen the launch what what's accomplished by telling them you know yeah. they've seen the <laughs> but he's just like so this guy in a balaclava and it's like on a little screen it is, um looks like a, a like a, a laptop from 1998 or something it's on a little screen and it's black and white and this guy in the black and why is he wearing a balaclava yeah <laughs> You destroy Americans, the 16 American cities, people are going to find you. Yeah, it, <laughs> they're going to track you down. Pretty much. Um, <laughs> you, you guys, I, I'm guessing, have all seen uh, Team America World Police. You nuke one American city. Let's forget the other 15 for a minute. You nuke one American city. <laughs> And we're going Team America World Police. I am sure somewhere there is a, you know, a red cellophane plastic sealed manila envelope that's just like don't open unless oh shit that's not quite the presidential football but might as well be because it's just like well america's just declared war on everyone everywhere don't yeah, get in like, way um, like a doctor strange love with the, the doomsday bomb yeah. <laughs> general he ripper <laughs> if there's any detonation on soviet soil they just launch all their missiles and all their bombs at once <laughs> yeah it gets the entire world <laughs> a nuclear bomb encased in thorium g <laughs> we destroy whole world mind fearer i can walk <laughs> you know you know what's funny is is in in that film they uh kubrick did not direct uh, Slim Pickens to play comedy. Uh, Ma Major Kong on the uh, the the uh, the B fifty two. He said, "Just deliver your lines straight. Just deliver them straight. You are a B fifty two commander." So it's like all of that he didn't. And the reason that Kubrick gave the role to Slim Pickens and not to Peter Sellers because Peter Sellers played. Uh, President Muttley, he played uh, the the RAF, uh, the RAF commander who tries to get him to call off the strike. He was going to play Major Kong's role too, and apparently Peter Sellers trying to do a Texas accent was sending everybody on the set into peals of laughter, like they could not keep it together to hear to to hear Peter Sellers do a Texas accent. Um. So the movie, yes, the movie is called Interceptor, and uh, if you want to defeat Asian Dawn, rent it on Netflix or whatever and watch it. So <laughs> we've had a we've got a couple of F Filipinos in uh, my gym here, and, um, and we often joke that because joke about it because there's a uh, in Indonesia, not Indonesia, in uh, Philippines, there's a terrorist group and a rebel army called the Moro Independence Liberate, uh, sorry, Moro Islamic Liberation Front, the okay. MILF, the MILF army. <laughs> and so we sometimes wonder if you like, they get young guys who come and join up and say, I'm here for the MILF army. <laughs> and they get a rather rude surprise. It's really not what they're expecting. No, this was not. I, I just, 
I got a pop up on my mobile phone that said, "Come to the Philippines for milf, <laughs> milf action," and <laughs> the, the, the the electrical taped an AK forty seven into my hands and shoved me into a shopping mall. <laughs> yes, uh, well, you must see the movie. Great yeah, eighty style action movie. It's a, a total vanity project by Matthew Roy. Um, and uh, ninety percent of it uh, takes place in one room, the basic the bridge of the Enterprise. I mean the uh, the command yes. center of the SPX one, the interceptor uh, base, and um, uh, barely any of it any of it makes any sense. And there's a, a lot of bad CGI for the backgrounds and that because they obviously used up their budget with all the uh, the, the screens that they put up in the bridge. Yes. <laughs> Um, but, uh, the, yeah, the female action star is jacked and, uh, she beats people up and there's a lot of witty repartee, like, why don't you die already? And, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Now, one thing I will, I will, I will only mention this in passing back in the, um, in the fifties and it may have even gone on to the early sixties as part of the B Muse distant early warning line we had <clears throat> in North America out in the middle of the Atlantic ocean off of Nova Scotia. They did have oil derricks like that with not with interceptors. Uh, the ballistic missile defense was not a thing back then. Um, but they actually did have radar bases sitting out in the middle of the ocean on oil derricks. And then, one night, one just friggin' disappeared in a storm. It was there, and then it wasn't. And they never even found pieces of pieces. So, um, yeah, we don't do that anymore because that's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm watching her sequences. So she has a jacked-up arm in one part, and she is swinging on the bottom of the oil derrick on a yes. series of, of rungs. Yes. With one hand, like yes. swinging yourself along. Yes. So, yes, she's doing Ninja Warrior basically. Yeah, <laughs> that TV show, Ninja Warrior. <laughs> yes, yes, Ninja Warrior. So, absolutely, see uh, maybe Cthulhu. That's my thinking. Like the the radar <laughs> waves were were like like impinging on his bridge work or something, and he was just like, enough of this. Um, <laughs> and then it's gone. Yeah, instead of zero terrorists, it's deep ones. <laughs> yeah. Come on, infiltrate the base. <laughs> so uh are you gonna are you gonna be back next week, Kyle? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Great. Um so school holidays, and, over. Uh, school holidays are over. Free men. <laughs> Um, Tonka Todd's asking about Kim Possible, which is an awesome cartoon. Um, and of course, sh we now have like as many viewers online as we've had all night. Ten. <laughs> so we're, we're wrapping up. Where were you people? Seriously, where were you two hours ago? Now you got to no go problem. all the way back to the beginning. Yep, you have to watch from the beginning. There will be a test. Yes, next week is the qu next week is the yearly quiz when we're going to quiz you on all of the stuff that Kyle and I have talked about, or not, because I don't, I barely remember it from the beginning of the show to the end. Uh, but uh, so uh, <laughs> Michael Connor says, still better, better, still better than modern Star Trek or Star Wars. Yes. Well, it is because, again, th this is a small group of people coming up with something creative and they're ripping everything off from other movies and that, and they don't care. They're enthusiastic and they're having fun. So they create something that's awesome. As I know. As opposed to whole committee and the whole corporation and yeah. too much money and, and so on. I, I mean, this at least has a somewhat decent plot that isn't bang two pairs of tightly uh, or of, of brightly colored tights wearing superheroes and supervillains together until you do a sky beam effect at the end. 
which is <laughs> everything that Disney's putting out right now. Um, so you got to give it points for originality or at least for taking from good things. Let me tell you what, one of the best, and it is legitimately scary, and it takes place on an oil derrick. Uh, films I remember from the 80s uh, when I was a kid is The Intruder Within. It's an alien ripoff in every way, shape, and fashion. And it's remarkably well done, but it's set here on Earth, not in space. Uh, and it's set on a remote oil derrick out in the middle of the ocean. So the crew can't just leave because <laughs> they're in the they're in the Arctic Ocean and they're beset with a monster. You can probably catch it on YouTube if you dig around long enough. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, and it, it's unoriginal in every way, but is it good? Oh, hell yes. Yeah. So that's creativity and gardens. You just, you, you take pre-existing plants and you plant them and you, you look after them and you let them thrive and you see what pops up spontaneously too. And you don't go into a Rogan show to talk about them. That's for sure. <laughs> and you let your garden grow. That's what Brian, you know, said about music. And I thought, Hey, that's role playing game campaigns. And it absolutely, it's absolutely true. Everything Kyle just said is a hundred percent applicable to your games. I apply it in my games and I've had a game going for almost a decade now. So no reason you guys shouldn't. Um, so next week we're going to talk about stuff and things and topics. <laughs> but until then, I do want to take a moment. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow. You guys have to put up with me tomorrow. Um, Kyle only has to suffer with me one night out of seven. So, but you guys, uh, you know, you, you, you get four nights, of, four other nights a week of me. But until then, I do want to, t until tomorrow anyway, let us thank Joshua Garlock, Lord Corian, Ricky Maru, Mobius, Kevin Reynolds, Doomsword Deathmaster, Mark Simpson, Damian247, James F. Keck, William Smith, the Dungeon Minister, Manny Wall, who is far too rare around these parts lately, uh, Mark Corey, Kevin Wood, Todd Sharp, Carnivore Farmer, Rob Knows I Can't Say That, Julius, Jeremy Rule, Bo Ganora, Mikey Mank, Sky Hernstrom, Pete Sullivan, and John David. Thank you all for helping literally keep the lights on here in the dungeon. You keep the torches lit and I can't complain. And if you're new to the show and you want to support us, that hasn't just been the daily football score scrolling across the bottom there. We're on Patreon and we're on subscribe star. You can check us out there, but you know what? Even if all you do is click that subscribe button and that bell icon for notifications, give the video a thumbs up. If you like it, if you don't give it a thumbs down and tell us in the comments what you didn't like, and we'll adjust because we're we're good people that way. Uh, so Tonka Todd says, please talk about the tomorrow war. Maybe we can do like a post-apocalypse extravaganza one of mm -hmm. these times. There were a about. lot of there were a lot of straight to video 1980s post-apocalyptic yes. action movies. Yes, and I think it may be time for you and I to, to visit those, Kyle, or revisit them. <laughs> Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll think the about age of big hair and big guns, big hair, big guns, big explosions, <laughs> big, big shoulder pads. If, if we see anybody in a suit, big shoulder pads, <laughs> red, red dawn is the standard by which all others are judged, but <laughs> there, there are many. So until then, keep your powder dry. Kyle, thank you so much for being here. Thank all you guys for being here, too. And we'll see you next time. Peace. Bye-bye, boys and girls.